All right. Uh, turn uh, to uh, two spots. Hold your fingers in Galatians 5 and turn to John 8. And um, John 8 is where we're going to hang out for most of our time towards the end. But um, speaking of kids, uh, I heard an interesting interview on, on NPR radio yesterday. Yes, you can listen to NPR and follow Jesus. Can I get an amen from somebody? Some of you are still a little bit like, yeah, I don't know how that happens, but there's a certain maturity you arrive at when that can happen. So uh, I was listening to NPR. They were talking about a new children's book out there. Now, I will tell you, I'm out of the realm of children's books with my own children, but it sounded intriguing, and it's a book newly written about teaching kids about caring and kindness. So write those two words down in your notes, caring and kindness. And talk about a kid's book that's appropriate and, uh, for an appropriate time. Amen, right? Like, these are, this is an author, and they're talking to the author and illustrator of this book about the importance of caring and kindness. And, um, but there was something intriguing that happened in the interview, in the conversation. So the interviewer is talking about the book, and then the interviewer asks a question about the, the message. And here's what the author said. We try really, really hard not to have morals in our book. We don't want our books to impart some kind of lesson. Now, if you're smelling a little bit stench of atheism there, you're right. Um, but this is the next sentence that really caught me off guard. But we do think the book should have meaning. So, and you're, you're responding the same way I responded when I heard, I go, how can you have this and not have it. You know what I'm saying? How can you have mor no morality and yet strive for meaning? The, the thing that they are avoiding is any sort of accountability to a creator. We live in a world that is fraught with people who are trying to discover meaning but don't be, get trapped with morality or ethics. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is a losing battle. Everyone is wired and designed by God to experience meaning. He, he's not hiding meaning from us. He's designed us to dig into the reason why we're here. This is one of the age-old questions that's haunted men and women for ages. Why am I here? What is my purpose? But yet, there is something in us that's wired in us that says there are certain behaviors you should avoid. There's certain behaviors you should embrace. Hence the book about caring and kindness. Where does that come from? But you can never divorce meaning from morality. But here's the danger, and you've heard me say this a lot, and this has everything to do with the fruit of the Spirit in this, this series we're doing. We are not to think that if we adopt a certain number of behaviors, that by practicing these behaviors, we're somehow good with God when there's no relationship with Him to begin with. You are to never strive for morality apart from a relationship with your maker. Here's what a strive for morality gets you without a God. More guilt, more shame, more condemnation. We're not, we're not, a, a, I don't preach a morally therapeutic deity who just is interested in us changing our lifestyles. Here's what God aims for first. I'm going to change your heart. And then you're going to want to live in a manner that reflects the ways you've been hardwired. See, when, when you explore that whole, de you know, that eternity in your hearts that Ecclesiastes talks about and try to do that without God, it only leads to more frustration. And that's what I want to spare us all from. These fruit of the Spirit are, and has this been a good series? How many of you like this so far? So I've heard a lot of people say, oh, this is so needed and so important right now. And I would agree with you. And here's the thing. I never want to stand up here and say, you know, love, joy, peace, patience can be yours. And I hope you practice those and go and live a good life. Our central focus is always about what God has to do as far as transformationally in our hearts before we become the type of people we, we ultimately need to be. And so that's why it's called fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of your striving. It's not the fr fruit of, boy, I hope I do good today. Like you got to give that, you got to give up that self-righteousness. You got to give up that self-assertiveness. You got to give up that self-striving and you just got to come to know God and just be, because that's how he's, he's going to love you, just in your being. 
and then you let him take over and have you do the doing, right? So, um, so today we get to talk about gentleness. This is one of those fruits that God is going gonna, is gonna to grow in us, but it's, it's so contrary to the world we live in. Another word you might have in your Bibles is meekness. You ever heard the term meekness? When you hear the word meekness as opposed to gentleness, I mean, gentleness is, oh, that's nice. But meekness almost sounds like it's, it's like soft belly, no conviction. Like I'm a pushover, I'm a doormat kind of mentality. Like when you hear that word, you're like, yeah, I don't want to be meek. But then the Bible says, but we're called to be meek. Meekness is not weakness. Okay, meekness is not weakness. Galatians 5 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, right? Gentleness, goodness, um, self-control, which is what we're going to talk about next week. So these are works of God in us. And I'm going to tell you right now that meekness or gentleness, another, this is another virtue, another fruit that is not highly regarded in a very self-assertive world. We live in a world where it is our goal to put other people down so we can rise higher. We, we are striving for power, prestige, possessions, positions. And it doesn't matter who gets, gets trampled on the way as long as I get what I want, which is no place for gentleness or meekness to grow. Matter of fact, here's some great, I love like thinking about synonyms of words. So write these down. When you think of gentleness or, or meekness, this is what the Bible wants you to understand. It has to do with humility. Considering others is more important than yourself. Um, Striving after the good of somebody else more than you pursue your own good. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Courtesy. Considerateness. Self-forgetfulness. It is this idea of, of really strength under control. So it's not saying you can't be strong. It's just don't be strong in an abrasive kind of manner. Because oftentimes, you know what, we, we can become kind of bullies, right? No one likes a bully, and what's even worse, no one likes a Christian bully. Kind of get an amen on that one, right? Intimidation is not the fruit of the Spirit, right? Being, you're going to like this word, pugnacious, being contentious, being argumentative are not fruit of the Spirit, See, all those words I just described, really, which is the opposite of gentleness, um, and especially, you know, being combative and, and seeing everything as a battle and a fight, you know, that, that reflects not a heart of gentleness, that, that's a heart of control. That's a heart of control. And if, and if anything, God's going to show us is how little we do have control of, of things outside of us. Really, the only thing in Christ you have control of, of is, is your own heart. And at that, sometimes we're, we fall short, amen? And so what we need to think of when it comes to, to, to gentleness or meanness is this strength under control. It's the opposite of forcefulness. It's the opposite of violence. It's the opposite of outbursts of anger when things don't work out the way I want them to work out or I have a strong disagreement with you. Gentleness and meekness is, is what helps us operate with one another in our world. And we need more gentle and meek people. Can I get an amen on that? Just so we're clear, meekness is learning to be self-controlled instead of needing to be in control. Meekness is opening your heart instead of clenching your fist. Meekness is the firm resolve that it is always better to suffer than to sin. All those things are very countercultural. Right? You're not going to take a course at Arizona State University, the great bastion of, of, of Christian education. No, it's not happening there, right? You're not going to get a course on, hey, uh, 101, learning to be gentle and meek, right? There was a book written years ago called Winning Through Intimidation. Like, is this the kind of book you want to read, right? And even though I know it's not about that, the title alone kind of makes you like, but people embrace this. Well, what can we learn from God about this topic? First point is this, that there's an invitation to gentleness, There's two characters in scripture that tell us about meekness. Matter of fact, meekness, gentleness, is is associated with their names. There are two names, Moses, Jesus. Write down those two names. Very familiar names to all of us who have either grown up in church or you're familiar with the the word. See, 
what we have to understand is this invitation to the gentleness is, is an invitation with, into a relationship with God who is gentle. How many of you celebrate the gentleness of God today? The fact that you know what your sin nature looks like and God is still gr gracious and kind towards you, that's his gentleness, right? That God puts up with us and yet he's in perfect control of his attributes and his actions. He's not flying off the handle. and getting, He could have flew off the handle with me and been totally just to do that, but he doesn't. He showed me gentleness. And he shows gentleness to, to Moses. And Moses, the Bible says in the, in the book of Numbers, is the most meek man who's ever lived on the earth. Do you guys know this about Moses? Now, mind you, Moses killed a dude. And yet God says he's meek. Well, here's the, here's the thing. He has a past. All of us have a past that can ultimately be redeemed by Christ. Amen? So here's the thing. Moses was just starting to get an understanding of what he was called to do and ultimately leading the people out of slavery from Egypt. Moses did not act gentle by killing somebody. He felt he was in control. But I'm going to tell you what, Moses spent the rest of his life being pressed by God to learn about meekness and gentleness. You want to know why this is true? He led millions of people out of Egypt and their main talent was griping and complaining. Now, I'm not talking like there was a small little quorum of people that were grumblers and complainers. Millions of people who were like, Moses, how come you let us out here? How come we don't have food? How come we don't have drink, right? How come this bourbon sucks, right? Whatever it is. And they're griping at Moses. And what is Moses, I'm sure there were moments where he's like, Lord, center, serenity now, right? Center my heart. I really want to kill these people. And I would imagine there were probably times when Moses was like, strike down fire from heaven now because I can't put up with this. Everyone was complaining. And how do you learn? You learn that you can't fight that. You can't resort to violence. You can't have outbursts of anger. He was a man who became, with God's help, the meekest man who ever lived on the face of the earth. So just in case you thought your little world was, was problematic with complainers and grumblers, try leading millions of people and having them be complainers and grumblers. See, Moses had to learn to be bold without being arrogant. He had to learn to be courageous and yet compassionate. He's a man who had to learn what the godly exercise of power looks like. See, we're not saying that meekness is powerlessness. It's power under control. And who embodies this perfectly? Jesus himself. Matter of fact, he, in Matthew 11, this is why it's an invitation to gentleness. Look what Matthew 11 says. Familiar passage to many of us. Matthew 11 says this, Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, Mr. Hudson on the slides, uh, Matthew chapter 11, you got that on there? My little tech dude, give it up for, for little Hudson back there. Awesome. Come to me. Here's the invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Literally, gentle and humble. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here's the invitation. Jesus says, I am um, among men and women who feel the burden of, of trying to exercise control without power, you know, power without control, trying to be self-righteous, trying to do it all on their own. And Jesus says, you have to stop and surrender. You have to come to me and you have to enter into my realm and I'm going to then do something in you. And I'm going to deposit a spirit of gentleness in you. This is why it's a fruit of the spirit. Left to ourselves, our sinful natures could never be gentle. This is why it is, it is part of the justifying work of Christ. When he died on the cross, he takes your unrighteousness and in exchange gives you his righteousness. Part of his righteousness is gentleness. Then part of our sanctification as we grow as believers is becoming like him. And that is why we need the Spirit's help. So the question is, do we understand what this looks like? 
in our lives. Now, knowing Jesus, he balanced being tough and tender, and I think you would agree. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, according to the prophet uh, Zechariah, who says he will be gentle and humble, yet riding on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem. You remember that scene? And everyone's saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, he's come, right? But just moments later, he's in the temple with a whip, turning over tables and gentle. But then he heals somebody tenderly. Yeah, gentle. And then he curses a fig tree. Gentle! Jesus throughout his life was able to have this complementary relationship between being tough and tender. You ask any woman in here this morning, like, what are the qualities you look for in a man? I want him to be tough, but I want him to be tender. Can I get an amen, ladies? Maybe the guys are saying the same thing. I want a woman who's tough but tender. I don't know about that. But research says we all want tough, balanced with tenderness. Jesus embodies this perfectly. Why? He's both lion, but he's also the lamb. Write those two words down. He's the lion because there are times when he needs to be tough. But even in his toughness, he's not abrasive. He doesn't come across as a bully. But in his tenderness, he realizes that I'm I'm engaging people that are already self-condemning and so shameful, I don't want to add to that. Here's what gentleness does. It doesn't add to burdens. It takes away burdens. Is that good? Yeah, we need to hear that. See, you know who Jesus was the most tough with? The, the spiritual people. Jesus was rarely tough with, with anyone that wasn't trying to prop up their own self-righteousness and, and be prideful and, and lack humility. He was always tough with the religious order who should have known better. And you know who he was most tender with? All the people the righteous people didn't want to associate with. All the people the religious people didn't want to. They were the ones who were like, you know, good riddance, go to hell, die on your own, die in your sins. We're not going to have any part of your life. And Jesus was the one who, you remember, was labeled a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Which, I'm going to tell you this morning, one of the indications that you're growing in gentleness as a fruit of the Spirit, how many sinners and tax collectors are in your life? If you look at your friends and they're all fellow legalistic, self-righteous, self-assertive people, you're not growing in gentleness. If perhaps your gentleness is offending the religious order, maybe that's something good. And maybe we need to have more sinners and tax collectors in our lives. Amen? This is one of the signs because gentleness attracts people who are hurting. That's why Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burden. Because sometimes we are the culprits of our own weariness, and sometimes we get that weariness from people who don't have a shred of grace to share with us. Jesus says, I've come to alleviate that. He is both lion and lamb. And his grace was leveraged in such a way where he met people in their worst of situations, and he draws them he draws them to himself. The woman at the well, the woman caught in the act of adultery, right? The lepers, the, the people who built their neighbors out of money, all the sinners and tax collectors. We're going to talk more about that here in a minute. So there's this invitation. So come to know Christ, find rest. But then be aware there's an implantation of gentleness into our lives by the Spirit. This is Galatians chapter 5. Ladies and gentlemen, now that you are in Christ, he is going to produce his life in you. This is what the fruit of the Spirit is all about, right? The love of Christ, the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ, the gentleness of Christ now becomes a work of the Spirit inside of you. These are things that aren't naturally possessed. They are supernaturally deposited within you. And so what is the call when it comes to the next point, uh, Hudson, the, uh, the implantation of gentleness? Thank you, sir. Is this, you are now called to imitate Jesus, and Lord knows you need the Spirit's help, amen? And so Matthew chapter 5, which is our main text for this fruit of the Spirit, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. So the key is we are called to display the gentleness of Jesus because we don't know how the gentleness of Christ in and through us is going to attract people to to Jesus. It It is a mechanism, if I can use that word, to help people see the beauty of Christ. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, you have that on the, on the screen, Hudson? Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, let your reasonableness be known to everyone that the Lord is at hand. 
how reasonable are you with people? This comes right after Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be me known to all people for the Lord's at hand. And then he says, don't worry about anything, but in everything pray. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are to be people in this world that are reasonable. That we are to, to, to somehow ascertain situations, discern circumstances in a way where this is not about my will. This is not about my rights. This is not about, you know, me coming out the strong one or the right one. This is about me saying, what sort of reason does God want me to bring to this moment? Paul marries gentleness with humility in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 4, he says this, uh, Brothers, sisters, live your lives in a manner that's worthy of your call in Christ Jesus, which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. So notice he uses those two words right there. Because humility gives birth to gentleness and gentleness gives birth to humility. So it's this like unending cycle with patience because Lord knows we all need to exercise some patience with people we're gentle with. We just can't take them out right there and right now. Bearing with one another in love. You know what that means? It will be a burden, but it's going to be a joyous burden. Boy, don't we need more bearing with one another in love? today. Not just bearing with one another. Notice Paul's clear. You're not just called to bear because sometimes we bear with one another, but we're not doing it in love. Can I get an amen from somebody? We need to do it in love. And so Paul says, get rid of self-importance with all humility and gentleness. Bear with one another. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 11. And I hope you're writing these down. These are good for further study. First Timothy 6 11. But as for you, O man, O woman of God, flee these things, pursue so you're to be active. These things don't passively happen. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. And you ultimately want to know why this is important. Galatians 6 verse 1. Hudson, you got that up there? It says this. Brothers, sisters, if anyone is caught in a sin, and can I just tell you right now, that's every single one of us. We all have those moments when we just kind of let our guards down. And whether you're, you're in Christ, sin still happens. Whether you're outside of Christ, sin happens all the time. But whether you're in Christ or not, if anyone's caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, notice this. You who are given the mind of Christ and ought to be reasonable, should what? Condemn further? <laughs> Lambast the person? Make them feel really extra guilty? No, no, no. Restoration is in order. Notice the word. Restoring means, it's a language, restoring like a, the broken fishing net, right? It's torn, it will not catch fish. You're called to make that net so it functions. Restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Because you know when we're weakest? It's when we're in our sins. And Lord knows we don't need other people coming up and condemning us because we're already condemning ourselves. Notice the fruit of the Spirit is not condemnation. Right? The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is not making sure your self-righteousness is seen in light of someone's unrighteousness. Bear with one another your burdens, the burdens, right? Be there it is again. Not only bear with one another in love, but bear one another's burdens. When's that happening in the body of Christ? What does this look like? It means when I see a brother or sister down, I'm not going to kick them when they're down. I'm not going to shoot them when they're wounded. I'm going to figure out how do I need to help this brother or sister up? And when you do that, you so fulfill the law of Christ. Is that not good? Yeah. See, what I hear in all these things I just gave you is there's a wonderful complementary relationship between truth and grace. Gentleness doesn't mean you're all grace and there's no truth, nor does it mean you're all truth and no grace. It's a balance of both. Because there are going to be moments when we have to address things in one another's lives. This is what the Spirit does. It says, if you see someone erring, you go to them. And let me just tell you, when you see someone in sin or you see someone in a difficulty, we, we don't go right, into that person and, and, and lick our lips because we love being the truth bringers to whatever the situation may be. If, that, if that's your motive, that's all about pride and arrogance. But it's in humility that we find it difficult, 
but we're drawn to do what we're called to do. And that is saying, I love you so much. I can't let you see, see you go on the path you've been going. Right? So there's a, there's a, there's a t- toughness, but there's a tenderness. The spirit should be, I know this person that's coming with me with, me with a difficult information is for me, not against me. We're in this together. Amen? And so this is the spirit, right? Paul says it, bonus verse, not in your notes. Write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 21. The Corinthian church was a problematic church. And, and Paul said, I'm coming to you to address my issues. But here's what Paul says, and I love how he says this. He says, I'm coming to correct you, but I'm doing it with love in a spirit of gentleness. And with that, I say, that's what I want. For me, that's what I want for you. Are you concerned about the offender's soul or are you more concerned about your own self-importance? See, I think this is key to what gentle restoration looks like. Now, I had a, a, a great lunch this week with somebody who a couple weeks ago was like, um, let me say this first. That if you have somehow um, elevated me or my wife on a pedestal and expect perfect performance out of us and nothing to offend you, I'm going to tell you right now, knock that pedestal down. Can I, can I get an amen? Here's the thing, and, and as, I'm going to speak as Pastor Scott. I'm also representing Pastor Lori because some people call her Pastor Lori, and I love that. Don't tell her her that, though. It goes all to her head. So, so. But, but me and my wife, we're in ministry together in our family. But here's, the, here, here's what happens sometimes, and I'm going to preface it this way, is sometimes we expect our leaders to somehow be infallible. And if I haven't offended you yet, I will. And if I haven't made you mad yet, I will. And if I haven't made you really upset and frustrated at me, I will. Can I just put that out there? And if I haven't do it, guess what? My wife will do it too. She'll, she'll do that. She'll say something. She'll do something. I just want you to know, I don't want any of you to have this expectation of us that's unrealistic. Because at, 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 at bare bottom, here's what we are. We are fellow sinners saved by grace and still being changed by Jesus. Now, I might give an error of confidence that somehow makes you think like, that guy's got it all together. Spend 24 hours in my home sometime and you'll realize that's a lie. (laughs) Okay? I'm going to tell you right now that as as God uses us, the enemy would love to bring division and disunity and and attack. You may say the same thing I'm going to say, but because I have this, this platform I get to say it from, it's somehow magnified a thousand times more. But just so you know, we are still being changed by God, by his spirit. And I don't want you to all of a sudden take something I've said or my wife said and then blow it out of proportion and then become like this internal faction of disunion. Just stop, you know. I'm not saying that's happening, but, you know, there's just times I think we get attacked by things. It's like we're human too. Amen? Yeah. So this is why I come back to this lunch I had this week. And I really appreciate the approach of this brother. Um, a couple of weeks ago, they said, um, hey, I'd love to grab lunch soon. There's just a couple of things in your message you said that didn't connect. And, and now 20 years ago, Scott would have been like, what? My message is perfect. It is polished. How dare you find anything? You know, that would have been 20 years ago, Scott. But I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like I become like this person that's like, Tell me what I did wrong, right? And I do it with a smile on my face because I want to learn. Like, I sit before my wife and go, how am I doing as a dad? And I better be ready for what she's going to say, right? Like, I've come to that in my place because my security is ultimately not in my performance. My security is in my, my Savior, right? I'm not finding my identity by how well a message goes off. I'm finding my identity by how much I'm loved by Jesus Christ. Amen? This is tough, And now someone wants to meet with me and talk about an area of my craft that I I accept as God's gift to me, and I love it. And I hear you guys say it too, like, thank you for the message. It was so good. And, you know, sometimes that could feed pride, but sometimes, and most times, I want to produce humility. Like, I'm just grateful to be a, a conduit of what God wants to say. But when all of a sudden someone wants to talk about it, I sit there and go, 
<laughs> Am I not good enough? Am I? I'm going to tell you right now, I, the word of God is infallible. I'm fallible. You are too eager to say right and affirm, and affirm that. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? I'm only as truthful as I'm in line with the word of God. Right? So the word of God is infallible. I'm fallible. So sometimes the messenger can maybe not communicate things so clearly. I hear from my wife, but now I get to hear from a brother who approached me in gentleness and said, I'd love to get lunch. So we had lunch this week. And for an hour and a half, we ate some amazing food. But I knew there was this topic we're going to talk about. And, and you know what? I'm going to say in an hour and a half, it was probably the most God-glorifying experience of what I'm talking to you about today. That someone said, I've got some things that are a little bit troublesome. They're a little bit, they've bothered me enough that I, you know, once in a while I'll say something and you guys go, I know what he means. That's Pastor Scott, right? He might cuss. He might say something off color or whatever. But this is something he said, I, I couldn't let it go and I want to meet with you. And the exchange of, of conversation that took place, there was no attacking there was no abrasiveness. I hope I wasn't defend, didn't come off defensive, right? It was just this openness that I felt like, boy, if there was a video camera filming it, like I'd want you all to see. Because I think when you're, no one wants to be invited to lunch and you know you're going to kind of be put on the, on the stand, right? Or you're not going to want the, the light to shine on, maybe something that you, you didn't communicate. And, and Lord knows there's things I say and I go, yeah, I probably should have said that better. I hear it every Sunday afternoon in my, in my house. You know, my wife's saying, oh yeah, and one other point you said, and then, you know, just kidding. I don't say, I'm almost perfect. No, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Uh, there are moments I need to be like, yeah, you know what? That came out the wrong way. And through a, through a series of, of clarifying questions in a spirit of gentleness and humility, I was able to say, yeah, I could see how that was misconstrued, but here's kind of something. And it was, it was a moment for me to go, Thank you. But it was also a chance for me to say, let me push back a little bit and, and tell you a little bit about where that's coming. And I think we both walked away going, we both learned something about each other. And we both grew from this experience. And, and a hug and an, and an I love you. And it's like, it's good to be in the same church with one another. And I sit there and go, that's awesome. So here's, here's if I'm not clear yet, if you have anything to address with me, one, it requires an invitation to lunch, your pain, and, uh, and then there's all the openness and receptivity you could ever want, right? So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But, but I love the approach, right? There's some things I, I want to I talk to you about. Let's grab lunch. The spirit of just the gentleness and the approach, the humility. Hey, I'm learning. You're learning. We're growing. We got this. I love that. And I wish... Christians were able to do this more. I hear of churches, again, not our church, every other church, because we got it all together, but I hear of churches where people leave without ever having conversations that lead to reconciliation and or restoration. If you leave with problems, they're your problems. Right? Can I get an amen? If you leave with problems and you don't, if the Spirit somehow isn't saying to you, be a peacemaker, but be a peace faker, the problems are on you. Get together and talk it out. Now, I'm going to tell you, it may not be smooth. It may not be eloquent. But the sheer fact you're meeting with someone that you might have a disagreement with is proof. The Spirit desires unity. Unity. And you know what? Sometimes you sit there and go, I don't agree, but I can disagree without being disagreeable with you. You ever heard that phrase? That's so important. If you don't know this yet, the older you get, the things you thought you would die for becomes a shorter and shorter list. 20 years ago, Scott, boy, my list was a mile long. I'm going to die for this, and I'm going to be contentious for this, and I'm going to argue this. Can I tell you, if you haven't heard my list yet, there's bulldogmatic, dogmatic, puppy dogmatic categories in my life. There's only three things that are in the bulldogmatic category, things I would die for, the deity of Christ, resurrection of Christ, salvation by grace alone. You want to talk about tongues? I'm not going to die on the hill. You want to talk about Bible translations? I'm not going to die on the hill. You want to talk about who to vote for in politics? I'm not going to die on the hill. 
Those might be dogmatic topics, but they're not bulldog. Because in the end, it doesn't matter who you voted for when it comes to entrance into eternity and hearing your father say, well done, good and faithful servant. Dogmatic topics are important. We should talk, but we should never break fellowship over them. Puppy dogmatic topics, not even worth our time. Refried beans or black beans, right? That's kind of like it. Like, it doesn't matter. And we're all hungry, so just let's keep moving, Pastor Scott, right? Bulldogmatic, dogmatic, puppy dogmatic. Too many of us have put things in the bulldogmatic category that are not worth dying for. I love what Augustine said 1,700 years ago. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Right? This is how we to live our lives. The world it perceives a lot of the church as Christian bullies. And we need to stop this. Because we're not inviting people closer to Christ. Here, let me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a series of questions for reflection. When you are confronted, when you are wronged, when you get all hot and bothered and you're tightening up inside, what does meekness look like in your own heart? When you come after your adversaries, you know, those people who you think are attacking you, is it, is it, is it with whipping or is it with weeping? Because there's, there's two tools you can use in your arsenal that are readily available. You can come with a whip or you can come with tears. Are you mourning someone else's sins or are you mourning your own? I think these are important questions to ask because meekness, again, is not about being a doormat. It's about being dignified even in the face of confusion and anxiety and injustice and being attacked. Amen? Which is why the next point is so important. And it's the inspiration for gentleness. Meekness is not meanness. Let me say that again. Meekness is not meanness. <laughs> Do you guys get what I'm saying? Some of you are like, oh, now we get it. Eight shots of espresso. That's what we'll do. I can hear snails crawl. That's, that's, that's my spiritual gift. Here's what you have to understand. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. So write that verse down. Matthew 5, 5. Hudson, you on top of that, bud? Are you watching the, the Cowboys game? Okay, good. <laughs> hey, I wish I was there too, bro. All right, so Matthew 5, 5. Was that a little too much truth? Hey, I love you. There's the grace, okay? <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here's what I want you to write down. As you write down this verse, I want you to write down a phrase next to it. I came up with this this morning. I really like it. All of us as followers of Christ have to embrace a theology of losing. Because the gospel demands a series that never ends of losing things. You will lose your reputation in following Christ. You will lose your worldly achievements. You will lose your worldly um, um, a, a, a accumulation of things, positions, power, proceeds, all those things that the world strives after, you need to understand you're gladly losing things to have something greater. This is what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the meek. Why? Because you're going to operate your life where you're going to lose being right. You're going to lose your reputation. Like I said, why? Because you're willing to make sure the gospel is the most important thing. When you are gentle, you need to understand that gentleness doesn't flex its muscle like the world does in going after the things the world goes after. Here's the exchange is that the world will lose what it ultimately lived for, but believers will gain everything they sacrifice for Christ. This is why if you back up in the Beatitudes, that's what this is called, chapter 5, verse 3, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the mournful, blessed are the meek. You have to lose 
your life. You have to lose yourself, number one. You have to lose a love for your sin. That's why you're mourning. You're losing the things you once found satisfaction in. And the last thing is that you lose the world. But it's a glad exchange because when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you realize that all other things will be added to your life. See, gentleness doesn't fight the world's battles. It gladly gives up on the things that the world values because it says nothing's more important than the kingdom. Again, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for truthfulness, right? And this is where there is a delicate balance and all of us would have to agree that this is where it gets tough. How do you balance the, the, the tenderness and the toughness? Last point. This is where we get to talk about this. Some introspection on gentleness. You guys ready? Three things. Application. John chapter 8. About time we get there, pastor. It's only taking you 35 minutes to get to our main text. Well, good news is we made it. Amen? John 8. Familiar passage. We could have gone to so many different passages for you to see the toughness and tenderness of Christ. And I think there's a wonderful application here. I'm going to tell you right now, I was really influenced by a, um, a, a, a speaker who, who shared this and pulled out some, some themes I want to kind of tease out a little bit with you. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 1. I mean, uh, John chapter 8. We've been in Luke way too long. Let's get to John, okay? Chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to show you this morning in this passage very quickly how Jesus is not just lion and lamb, right? There's moments when he has to be very lion-like, usually with the religious leaders. He has to be very lamb-like, those with a, that, are, that are in sin and they feel the shame and guilt of that. But he's also the good shepherd. Write that down. He's the good shepherd that has a responsibility to lead the sheep to a place of rest and, and nourishment, but he also has to protect the sheep from the ravenous wolves, right? And, and in this, you know, we, and we're all like sheep. There's a reason why the Bible says we're like sheep. We're just kind of dumb and make poor choices, right? Don't we all sin at times? And when in sin, you think insane. Write that down. When in sin, you think insane. Jesus understands this, that you don't have this right frame of mind. So he's the good shepherd, his rod and his staff lead us. His staff leads us to the appropriate spots. The rod protects us from the ravenous wolves. Check this out. John 8. So Jesus gathers in the morning. Goes to the Mount of Olives, verse 2. Early in the morning he comes and he's at the temple and with all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. As like Jesus, he attracts a crowd. And you know what I love about the majority of the crowd he attracts? is that these are people that are hurting. And the religious order of the day is not helping them in their hurt. But he's a friend of sinners and tax collectors. And the scribes and the Pharisees, boo, they brought a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Meaning, here were the guys who should have been the teachers of the word of God, sharing the law of the Lord. But these were self-righteous, hypocritical leaders. And they bring a woman caught in the very act of adultery to Jesus. Now, literally, they set up the, the scene. They hired one of their own to be the John. He hires the woman. They go to the Jerusalem Motel 6 or wherever they went to. They're in bed and literally the religious leaders pounce on the, this couple in the, in, the, in the moment of actual sexuality. They grab the woman from the very act and bring her to Jesus, not even clothed, probably just with some sort of sheet around her. Is there a desire to restore this woman in a spirit of gentleness? No. They are honed in on hate. Because the woman is a pawn because their ultimate goal is just to discredit Jesus. Good news is Jesus knows this. So this woman's standing before him half naked. And the men say to him, verse 4, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. We've literally pulled her from this man's bed. Here's the question. Where's the dude? Because he's part of their posse. So he gets, he gets off scot-free. 
And she's the one, but they don't care for her. Gentle people care for the souls of people hurting. I'm going to say that again. Gentle people care for the souls of people hurting. So stop, and in, in when you're, you're being attacked by someone, here's a, the, 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 the discipline to say, this person's attacking me. I'm not going to react to the attack. Oh, I like that phrase. But I'm going to respond to their heart. I'm going to somehow try to go, what's going on with their soul that they would attack me like this? Jesus says, now the law, oh, so they say the law of Moses, verse 5, commanded us to stone her, kill her. What do you say? So they think they have Jesus in a catch-22. They're thinking, thinking to themselves, we've got the perfect setup. If he says that we should let her, let her go, then he's soft on the law of Moses. He's soft on the word of God. He doesn't mean what he really means. Or if he says to kill her, then he's no longer a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Either way, they got him, right? So what does he do? He doesn't even respond. Can I, can I tell you something? First, second service only. This didn't happen for the first service. Can I tell you something? Not every text message needs to be responded to. Not every email needs to be responded to. Not every comment needs to be responded to. Some people out here, I'm not going to say who. I don't even know who. You're a little bit too thin-skinned. Every comment is an attack. Can I just tell you, get over it. Grow some thick skin. Some offenses are worth overlooking. A lot of text messages are not worth responding to. Amen? Ooh, I like that. That's good. All right, no more. So as they were saying this, verse 6, notice what Jesus does. He doesn't respond. He doesn't owe them an explanation either way. So now he's got them. And what does he do? He, in, and they were saying this in order to test him. He knew this. In order that they might prove, have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stoops down and with his fingers writes on the ground. Question is, what was he writing? The word write literally means writing a list of offenses you're guilty of. You know what Jesus was doing? Hey, Tom, idolatry, murder, anger. Oh, Bill, adultery, greed. He started writing not only their names, but the list of sins they had never repented of. And you're standing there and you're going, uh-oh, there's my name. What are you going to do? You would probably do like these guys just did. They bust in. Hey, 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 hey. Answer us. That's what they do. Look at verse 7. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said, hey, who is here without sin? Go ahead and throw the first stone. If you're here and you're sinless and perfect and you got your life all together, go ahead. Kill her. And he goes about writing names and sins on the ground again. And it says, starting with the oldest, to the youngest, they all departed. He didn't come with a whip. <laughs> Jerry, there you are. Get, get out of here, right? Like his gentleness, even in the toughness, is on display towards these religious hypocrites. But think about this woman who's witnessing this. She knows she's guilty, she feels the weight of her sin. So Jesus first deals with those attacking her, honed in on hate, not helping, but just wanting to hurt. They all leave. Look at verse 9. And when they heard this, they all began to leave, right? And he was left alone with the woman. So it's just the two of them. Now, the question is, do we know what happens to this woman? Yeah, we know she's saved. Why? Because it's just the two of them. She has her story to tell. That's why it's here. Verse 10. He straightens up. Jesus says to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She says, not one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and from now on sin no more. There, this is awesome. Like I said, we could have, 
We could have gone to the prostitute who broke the perfume at the feet of Christ at the Pharisee's house. We could have gone to the, the, the well with the woman, John 4. We could have gone to the tax collector who, who built his neighbors out of money to, to line his own pocket. We could have gone, to, I, want, I like this passage. And I think there's three things we need to tease out of this and they're in your notes. The, the three points are, Hudson, you good? All right, I know I was, I was a while. He's, he's getting back. Like. Number one, Look at your friendships. I think this is an important thing. I mentioned it earlier. If, you, if the title friend of sinners and tax collectors can't be attached to you, you're not being gentle enough. I, I want you, I would love you know, for people to be like, oh yeah, yeah, that person loves church and they love the Bible and I, I know they pray all the time. Here's what I want. And those things are good. Here's what I would love to hear. They're a friend of sinners and tax collectors. See, those leaders meant that for Jesus as like a, 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 a phrase of derision. As if, oh, how dare he? I sit there and go, yeah, how dare he? Because I was one of them. I was one of those sinners and tax collectors. And then I was shown the grace of Jesus. Would you agree with me that we should look at the people in our lives because... I don't want to, I mean, moral people are fine, but moral people hated Jesus. People who had their lives all together hated Jesus. But it's not those who are well that need a physician. It's those who are sick. And if you look at the parable of the prodigal son, write that down, look at it later. Luke chapter 15. It's that son who wins, goes and spends his father's inheritance, the inheritance that he got from his father. Wine, women, songs, sex, drugs, rock and roll blows it all, comes back, and he's welcomed back into the family. And all the religious leaders are offended. And then Jesus says, but let me tell you about the older brother who just sat in the corner of the yard, just sulking in his own self-righteousness, like, oh, how dare my little brother treat you like that when all I've done is obey your every word. And the father pleads with the older son because the parable is not about the younger son. The parable is about the older brother. And the older brother is the Pharisees. And all they can see is that people are being changed and being transformed by the grace of Jesus. And they're offended that sinners and tax collectors are going to Jesus. And Jesus says, that's the purpose. That's the mission. So here's your homework. Go get some more sinners and tax collectors in your life. And be gentle to them. That doesn't mean you don't speak truth to their lives. But may that truth be seasoned with grace. And may there not be an iota of, of abrasiveness in your tone. May your conduct and your approach be gracious. Let the truth do the surgery. Look at your friendships. Number two, love the unenlightened. We seem to think people ought to get it. And guess what? People don't get it. They're blind. Sin makes you insane. Sin clouds your thinking. Sin does not make you reasonable. Sin does not allow you to be discerning. Sin does not lead to wisdom. Lord knows I didn't get it for a long time. And yet God was still committed to me. How many of us have people in our lives that don't get it? And if you're sitting there going, I don't have anyone. Maybe you're the one that doesn't get it and needs to hear this today. Can I get an amen from somebody? Here's the thing, love the unenlightened. Second Timothy chapter two, you're gonna to wanna to write these verses down. These are, this is gold. Second Timothy chapter two, you got that Hudson? So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now notice this, have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. How many of us have been wrapped up in foolish and ignorant controversies? You know that they breed quarrels, exactly. We have felt that. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to who? Those who only agree with you? No, everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil. That's the unenlightened. That's the unenlightened. Patiently, in, God put up with you patiently. You do the same. 
correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to knowledge of the truth. There's the goal. Through your course of bearing the fruit of the Spirit and being patient and being kind and being gentle, you become a vehicle for someone's life change. We, I don't think we stop to consider the fact that sometimes in our sinfulness, we're hindering people from seeing the beauty of Christ. Stop. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But be ready to give an account of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect. Everyone's hurting. But be gentle because you've found healing for your hurt. And his name is the balm of Gilead, Jesus himself. Amen? See, love those who don't get it and never give up on them. And pray that God opens the eyes of their hearts. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The same God who said, let there be light when it came to the physical creation says, let there be light in the hearts of those who are unbelieving and he turns them into believing. Only God can do that. Don't be a hindrance in God's work in someone else's life. Love the unenlightened. Last point, lead with grace. Always lead with grace. Write down two words, grace and law. Jesus never leads with law. Never. Why? Because just being law abiders and obeyers produces self-righteous hypocritical people. When you lead with grace, the love for the law is secondary. Notice what Jesus says to the woman. Where are they who are going to condemn you? They're not here. Exactly. Neither do I condemn you, grace. Go and sin no more, law. How important is this? If I think God will only be gracious to me when I clean up my life, I am on, uh, on an unending spiral downward into self-righteousness, hypocrisy, and condemnation. But when I understand God loves me as I am, where I am, and once I fall in love with him, I desire to become a better person. It's not my duty, it's my desire. Grace always comes before law. This is exactly what the cross of Christ is about. Christ dying a death, you should have died, I should have died, but he doesn't make us die for it. He takes it for us the righteous for the unrighteous, shows grace like I've never seen or experienced before. He gives his son in that while we are yet sinners, he dies for us. Grace. And once we realize there's been that spiritual transformation now because of what Jesus wants to do for me, I now want to love the law. But if I try to love the law without grace, that love for law becomes legalism. Let me say, this is too important to pass up, even though pizza for kids ministry just showed up. <laughs> Fear without forgiveness will only lead to more fear. But when forgiveness dispels fear, it results in freedom. Forgiveness to be loved as you are where you are. Forgiveness to be loved and accepted like you never thought possible, even though you know all the junk going on in your life, now frees you because First John says perfect love casts out fear because perfect love has been shown to you and now you know there's a God who sees all, knows all, loves you like crazy, has promised to never give up on you and when you experience that kind of divine love, it doesn't matter what anyone else says, there is freedom. Amen. There is freedom. Lead with grace. 
By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. May people taste and see how good and gracious God is. And may you be vehicles used by him to, to see people see the same Jesus you've come to know. This is why the woman in John 4 goes and announces to her whole village, she's been married five times, she's sleeping with a guy she's not even married to, that's called leasing with an option to buy, Jesus doesn't encourage that. She goes into the village and announces to everyone, come see somebody who knows everything about me and still loves me. Are you flipping kidding me? When was the last time you went out and prayed at all your sins for everyone to hear with a smile on your face? Come meet someone who has disclosed my entire life and I want to announce he loves me and accepts me. It's good. We need that. The world needs that. Praying for gentleness to grow in our lives. Use your strength to serve the weak. Use your strength to save the wayward. Use your strength to love the unlovely. Use your strength to show grace to the shameful. Use your grace to show people how good and glorious our God is. Amen? Stan, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for meeting us at this time in this place. What a gift. What a gift to be able to see one another, to hug one another, to, to cry together, to sing together, to pray together, to, to explore your word together, to be challenged together, to be convicted together, to be, to be uh, just exhorted towards something bigger and better. Lord, thank you that you're able to do in us a work that is impossible for us to embrace on our own. We, we are desperate for you. There's a dependency we need that says, Lord, I cannot produce this fruit by myself. And, and you say to us, you were never meant to. May we abide with Christ. May we adore the, the Savior like we've never adored him before. May we just daily fall in love over and over again with, with the, the good and gracious God that you are. May we be men and women who take that message out to, to not condemn, but to hopefully help others experience freedom. Lord, and that only comes through the personal work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for transforming us. May we be transforming agents now out in the world, even among our, our church with one another. Thank you that you have never given up on us, nor will you, but you're going to perfect your work till the day of Christ Jesus. So we, we submit ourselves to that. Thanks for uh, all that you've shown us and all that you revealed to us and all that you've done for us. And it's in, in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great, great day, all right? We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.